three? I don't know shit about fuck. Are you okay. fucking Canadian? I like sucking. Like Come on, man. Legit bad podcast. He has a legit bad. Can you see us? Yes, here we are. Hi, I'm Joe. Jen's with me. Ben is not here. Uh, we won't go into that. No, I'm just kidding. He's fine. We got Jake from Local Listens on tonight, and I don't think we have anything else to talk about except the show. It's Sunday Night Shit Show. Thanks for uh, joining in live and listening on audio. So we'll get it going right off the top here with Jake. Uh, just tell everybody where we can find you, what you do, and who you are, and your name, and your street address, and your social security number, and then we can start the show. Excellent. I can bend over the for the anal swab next if you'd like. You know, just let me know when yes. I'll be ready. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I just want to say first, Joe and Jen, you're probably one of the first podcasters I've ever spoken to, like face to face. And Joe was kind enough to in invite me on to do like a mic check weeks ago, just to figure out some technical stuff. So thank you guys for helping me getting. Thank you guys for helping me get started. Uh, it's been really cool to connect with all of you. But my name is Jake. I'm a 10th grade English teacher. I do a little social media marketing on the side, but really what I'm most excited about is for the Loco Listens podcast that I just launched today, actually. I just put out my first episode with Mira Taylor at the Moon and Rune. Thank you. Uh, the Moon and Rune Gnostic Wellness um, webpage with all of her healing methods and it was really cool it was basically like a therapy session uh so that's my first episode go and check it out on all platforms and i'm at loco listens on instagram but joe and jen i'm happy to see you guys how's it going today good dude uh good. so what do you i mean i kind of got the idea your show is probably gonna be like ours where it's just whatever like we just get people on and then talk about whatever it does uh lean towards conspiracy i'm assuming at mm -hmm. some point on your show and uh obviously you had mira taylor on we talked to her a couple weeks ago on probably talk at the tavern or something like that but mm -hmm. uh so oh, i think so so then you're into that side of it too the kind of the spirituality type of thing so there's no shortage mm -hmm. of people you can talk to in this community i mean just go back and look at any of uh, Alt Media United's podcast and find all these people and you can pretty much get hooked up with whoever you want to talk to. It's funny how in this community it's growing towards that. It kind of started with this mm. conspiracy of like, oh, the government's lying to us, which is obvious. And once you dig into that, you can see very clearly that's happened all along. But then it mm -hmm. moves into this spiritual growth thing and it gets mixed mm -hmm. in with the conspiracy side so easily. And I feel like that side of it is growing more and more where we'll talk to people who are hardcore like news, lies, government conspiracies, and then they will say something about like anything, a spirituality growth, some right. higher activity thing. And it's like, whoa, okay, I never thought this was going to go here, <laughs> but it happens more and more often. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that left brain and right brain split. Like most conspiracy theorists want to dive in and like research and, fi and find out what's actually happening. And that's on their left brain, I suppose. But on the right brain, they've counterbalanced that with spirituality, with the imagination, creativity. So absolutely, there's no shortage of people who want to dive into both sides. And the best part is, like, Loco listens. The, the whole idea there is I will listen to anyone. I don't care what your views are, if you're pro this or anti this. You know, I just want to talk to anyone and see what they're up to and see how I can learn from them. I want to consider myself a lifelong learner to hopefully we can all learn a little bit uh each show one show at a time so happy to be oh, on the yeah. shit show it's uh can you guys That's tell me a, a little bit about uh like how you thought of the shit show like is there uh any kind of story behind the first shit show i was kind of wondering no that there's there's zero thought that went into it so it was just 
I, I got tired of when we started doing videos, especially live streams. I'm like, it's kind of hard to title your video in advance mm. when you don't know mm. what the fuck you're going to talk about because that's the way the show goes. So I was like, it's just a shit show. Like, it's just people that come on and it's fucking train wreck sometimes. Who knows? You know? So I just started titling it shit show and then I'd put little pictures of poops and stuff like that. So the only time I know when what we're going to be talking about is if it's somebody that has a very specific thing they do. Yeah. You know, like, it would be easier like with a uh, Natasha Kashinka or something like that. Cause we know what she does and what she's about, mm -hmm. but it's still hard to kind of title a show ahead of time. So I just started generally titling it that. And then when I release audio, I kind of put more of what we actually talked about into the title. So yeah, but, there was no thought. The to Sunday it. night shit show though. I do feel like it evolved from being, we do a regular show every Thursday mm -hmm. and then Sunday we would just get together cause we didn't have to work or do anything. We were just like, all right, let's get together and do a show. And it was just kind of like whatever. And then we took that and kind of made that into Planet Retard, where we talk about fake news stories and kind of talk shit for 20 to 30 minutes before this show, because then this show became we kind of talk shit, but get into some deep shit with an actual guest as well. Awesome. You know? And yeah. speaking of uh, the Planet Retard, you know, I got to give a quick shout out to Shane from Inquiries of Our Reality. I just had a great chat with him on Saturday morning in a Dunkin' Donuts because my fucking Wi-Fi was all cut out. So I went <laughs> to this loud-ass Dunkin' Donuts and they're like making espresso and things are falling off of the shelves. And it was awesome. It was definitely way out of my comfort zone. And Shane was really cool. He understood like this strange hurdle that I was getting through, but we had an awesome time. So I'm looking forward to going back on your Patreon to go and listen to Shane. Uh, he's a He's a great guy. Really excited for his podcast. Once again, that's Inquiries of Our Reality. Looking forward yes. to Yes. Yeah, that. and he's coming on our show at the end of this month. Yeah, I'll have to look. I, I know I scheduled him on. Uh, yeah, and he was just on Planet Retard tonight. So yeah, it was kind of a weird one. We kind of breezed through it. I didn't find very many articles and then felt super sick right before we did the show. So I said, oh, like, no. No. but he did. And we had a lag too. So I feel really bad because he would try to talk and then we'd try to talk and it was just mm. kind of got jumbled. It wasn't bad. It wasn't anyone's fault. Just stupid Wi-Fi shit like you were talking about. Yeah. So I, th I think I sent Joe a message earlier. I was like, all right, I'm ready for tonight. Just playing, uh, praying to our overlords at Google to please not fuck with my bandwidth. And we've we've made it this far. So <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> uh. Yeah, right. Thank you, oh great overlords. We did a show a couple of weeks ago where it was a bunch of conspiracy people on not really our jam, but like they're all nice people and we didn't have a whole lot to put into the conversation. We were just listening and adding as we could. And uh, their Wi-Fi cut out almost immediately when they went live. So then someone else had to host and then our power went out for like two minutes while we were wow. doing it. And then something else happened to someone. It was so weird. As soon as uh, he said, as soon as she got off or something that it... Right. It went back on. It was a weird fucking yeah, night. Yeah, so they had a Wi-Fi uh, outage. Was, and then as soon as they logged off and they all ended with everybody, their Wi-Fi immediately cut back on. Mm. So strange. I don't Those know if that's... Archons you know, like to fuck know, with us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they can do whatever they want and make it look like a mistake or an do, accident. Do you get into some of that stuff? Some of the Aeon Byte, uh, Gnostic type stuff? Oh, like, yeah, I, yeah. I've been chatting with uh, Miguel. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Miguel have been, and... Uh, yeah, no, I'm going to go on. Uh, so Miguel has, you know, Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, and I love Miguel and the Moondog Vance. I've been listening to them since like 2018, I think. Uh, it's really cool. Oh, wow. And uh, Miguel also has this other show called Finding Hermes, which is more so about uh, recovery, addiction. So that's where I'm going to go on and chat about Dante's Inferno. And I'm really, I'm really pumped because nice. Miguel was one of the first like very artistic, creative podcasters that I found after going into like Joe Rogan and Jordan, P and Jordan Peterson when I first started listening to lectures or podcasts. So shout yeah. out to you, Miguel. Yeah, I have. I want to ask you guys though. Uh, yeah. Oh, I would love to. I'd love to dive into some Gnosticism, but I wanted to ask you guys, uh, how many episodes do you have now? Because I heard you telling this story earlier. Uh, when your kids are old enough, one day they're going to have hours and hours of content to listen to and to get to yeah. know who their parents are in a much different way so how many episodes are you at now okay. i would have to look let me see i know it's over 100 it's... definitely over 100 because we didn't do a hundredth episode oh, celebration uh, we forgot about 142 it. 142 oh, so that's nice. including like uh swap cast or other like mm -hmm. 
our actual main shows that we do is probably about at a hundred, but I, I put other stuff on there, you know, uh, appearances on other shows and stuff like that. But total, nice. as far as Apple tells me, 142, but interesting. Oh, so that's, yeah. Dante's Inferno. That's what I was going to ask you about. So did you talk to Shane about that or are you, are you did, uh, yeah. bored of that yet or what? Cause I, no, I not know. at all. Not at all. Uh, I actually have been un uncovering new layers of Dante's Inferno today uh, when I was listening to Expanding Reality, Generation Z, and the Deep Shares. That's Andy, Brandon, and Dave. And they were going into Box Saga. And they were talking about a little bit of alt history. So the fact that uh, at Atlantis could have been phonetically related to a land of ice, a uh, land ice. And this was kind of referring to the ninth circle of hell, which is frozen at the very way bottom of hell. Uh, it's not fire, it's all ice. And it kind of reminded me of some of these other uh, hollow earth uh, discussions that I've barely scratched the surface on. But yeah, there's always more to talk about with, with Dante. I'll probably never get bored of it. And yeah, Shane and I, uh, we dove into it in a pretty different way as well, because he also read the entire book beforehand to kind of like prepare. So he was able to share a lot of cool insights that I had never thought of before. And he also uh, is more familiar with the historical perspective. Like one thing that most people don't realize is that Dante was a victim of cancel culture. So he was exiled and he was not allowed to go back to Florence, Italy. So this book was basically his manifesto after getting canceled. Huh. Yeah, see, I've never read the book because I don't prepare or do research. So that's why I have people on that have read the book. So, I mean, if you're super knowledgeable about it, kind of break down the, the basics of the story for people who don't know. I know the basics, but that's about it. I know I had to read it in college and mm. I also had to take notes for somebody. And I was so irritated because they told me he was disabled, but he could ask questions and he wasn't like he was totally fine. So I was mm. pissed and I had to take notes while I'm reading it. I had to take double notes and I barely paid attention. We also had to read the Iliad and the Odyssey and I had to do that for all three yeah. books. So I don't remember anything from them at all. I took in zero information. So I want to hear- Me too. I, I yeah, I went through the same <laughs> process probably like four or five years ago. My professor gave us the spark notes basically. So if we didn't read it, it was like, it didn't matter. So no one read because <laughs> there was no uh, incentive to. Um, yeah. But then later on, uh, probably four months ago, I was at work, you know, I work in a local high school and they sometimes give away free books. So I saw Dante's Inferno there. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that one college class where I was like fucking around and sleeping and let me take a second look at it. And I just got really sucked into it. And now that I've, uh, you know, I've gone back and read it twice, basically, um, I could say this, that Dante's Inferno, above all else, is an allegory. So when you look at the structure of the story, it's a three-part series of the divine comedy. And the Inferno is part, part one. That's all about becoming aware of your sins or your errors or your flaws. Part two is in purgatory. So that's the active mission of re renouncing those sins. Or it's that process of letting go of those things that are holding you back preventing you from reaching the third stage, which is paradise. So book book three is all about paradise. And to be honest with you guys, I haven't read book two or, or book three. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get into that. But the Inferno is really cool because the way the story starts is that Dante wakes up in the middle of the forest and starts to realize like, shit, I've been living a, ter a terrible life. I need to fix some things. And it's almost as if he was on this long bender. And then he like, became awake all of a sudden and was like, all right, I need to do something about this. So just from that starting point, we can all relate. We've probably all had that aha moment where you wake up and you're like, yeah, I need to, I need to make some changes around here. And that's something allegorically that we can all relate to. What do you guys think? How does that go? Is it like an allegory? Like, a, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, super mm. Christian book, but it's uh, an allegory. So it's like, told in a story way but it's all all the names and the things that happen are all like metaphors for life and shit so is it kind of oh, like yeah. that i didn't even know it was a story i thought it was like a more of a uh analytic or um like academic type thing but I'm oh, I see, yeah yeah just to uh clear that up i'm glad you asked joe so the dante's inferno and in this three-part series of the divine comedy is technically a poem 
or it's like an epic poem. Uh, but you know, we can refer to it as a book. It's no big deal. We're not going to freak anyone out with that little thing, but, uh, allegorically, yeah, it's like the hero's journey. So just like the pilgrims, what's it called again? The pilgrim's way or the pilgrim's, pilgrim's path? progress, pilgrim's progress. Uh, it's yeah. not that hero's journey cycle. So you start off somewhere and you go through a process and you're changed as a result. So it's that universal hero's journey that, uh, we all go through you know, throughout the years that we're maturing or in certain parts of our existence, we're traveling to a new place, whether that's physically or spiritually, mentally, and then being changed as a result from that journey. So it's not really about Dante reaching that last circle of hell, but it's about how he's changed while he's traveling down and down and down. Interesting. So does book one get into the different layers of hell? Because oh, yeah. you said you didn't read book two or three. So is that just an extension of the original book or is it the continued story? Like what, what's that? Yep. All? I mean, it's a you, if you story. Ready, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Inferno Dante will go through all nine circles of, of hell. And the very last chapter is actually when he reaches that last circle and he comes out on the other side and looks up at the stars and realizes that he's, he's, he's progressed far enough to escape hell. And now he can start climbing up the mountain of purgatory. So that's where book two would begin. Um, so yeah, throughout this first book, it's Dante and Virgil, who is like his spirit guide. Dante and Virgil travel through each of the nine realms or the nine circles. And so that's huh. there's a lot packed in in those nine circles there. I bet. I'll have to get it on audiobook sometime. Do you remember anything about it when you read it, babe? What's Virgil like? So was Virgil pretty... <sighs> I feel like I was expecting Virgil to be bad because he was guiding Dante through hell, but mm -hmm. he's not. He just is. He just kind of speaks truths and helps mm -hmm. Dante grow. I don't. I don't know. I. I don't remember the whole book. I do. Like I said, it was in college. It was a long time ago, and I had to take notes for a kid that wasn't. I mean, maybe he was disabled. I don't know. Did you get he paid just, for that? Like, were you just like you know? No, no they just said. Hey, you, I had good grades because I was older. I went to college when I was 23. I wasn't 18, so I was a little older, and I just didn't party and do whatever. Like, I had a kid, so <laughs> so I had to – they just said, oh, you you appear to be a responsible individual. You have good grades. Could you please take notes for this kid? And I was like, of course I will. A disabled person, yes. And then that same person would disrupt the class. He could have potentially had autism, so I'm not, like, shitting on him, but he would ask questions and raise his hand, and I'm like – he has hands. He can write. I was just being an ignorant 23-year-old. Like that was just me being ignorant. So I'm I was being a dick. So I didn't pay as much attention because I was more irritated. So I I didn't I definitely didn't read it with an open eye as I should have. Yeah, it's pretty distracting. Like, Especially when he's raising his hand. It's like, well, he's clearly he, he's probably <laughs> capable I, of taking notes. Yeah. It's like all right. right. But then yeah, now that I look back, maybe he couldn't form those kind of thoughts in his head to take yeah. the right kinds of notes that he would have to take, of course. Sorry. But Whoa. um no, I want to read it again. I just remember it being it was different to read because it is kind of like a poem. It's the yeah. verses look strange. It's not just reading a story. It's not like reading a novel or something like right. that. So well, I'll have to get the audio book because I don't have time to read actual books for the most part, but I can tear through some audio books. So I'm sure oh, yeah. I'm sure that's available. But what do you what stood out the most to you? What do you like do you know it well enough where you could give like an overview of each of the levels of hell? Because that's what I'm interested. Yeah, I want to know that each level in uh in order and exactly what they no, I'm just kidding. Just give me your best, <laughs> your best go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, the first question, what stood out to me was really the fact that this was an allegory. Because when I first heard about this story and when I didn't read it when I was in college, it was because, oh, well, this was just a book that was written to put the fear of God into people. And it was just like uh, propaganda, basically. It was like, uh, you know, like weaponized Catholic literature that was supposed to make people be better Christians. Um, but I was wrong, actually. It's not really supposed to scare you it's not supposed to depress you either it's really a story like i said about dante transforming um so to also to back up earlier because you had questions about virgil so dante has uh, a lover he loves this woman named beatrice and quick funny story that i people who have listened to this over and over again are probably sick of it but my middle name is b um jacob b and what do you think b stands for uh, Bert, uh, Beatrice, Bert, 
Beatrice. Yeah, I had a great gra- uh, great grandmother named Beatrice who I never met, but she was apparently cool and so cool that they had to name me after her. So when I figured that out, I was like, oh yeah, okay, this th- this book is like causing all these synchronicities it's uh making my ears buzz a little bit so i just wanted to throw I'm that out there. calling you beatrice from now on i i wouldn't be uh opposed to that you know she was a pretty cool lady and dante was willing to go to hell and and back just to reach beatrice because the thing is beatrice is most likely had passed away or was stuck up in paradise which i guess that means you're probably dead and you're in, and you're in heaven so she was waiting for him makes sense, yeah 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 um so that's the whole purpose of dante doing this is to go and reach beatrice now virgil was sent by beatrice to guide him and virgil is good by the way he's a poet he does use language to escort dante through this hellfire realm because a lot of the demons and dark souls that are down there want to fuck with dante but virgil is able to non-violently just stop them with his language and his words so he's like uh dante's escort so yeah i want to ask you guys too uh in the first part of the story dante is trying to get into the entrance of um the the mount of purgatory so he can climb it and go to paradise to find beatrice but his path is blocked so he has to go a different way. And that's when Virgil steps in and guides him towards this entrance into hell, which is a physical place, which is really interesting. So Dante was exiled from Florence. You know, he was a victim of cancel culture and he was wandering in the wilderness of the Italian peninsula. And somehow Virgil led him to, I'm guessing it's some kind of cave or some kind of actual place where he could walk down and step in into hell. Uh, so that uh, that's a, a lot more um, conspiracy alt history that I have to look into. Like there's actual entrances to the hollow earth or to Agartha or things like this that I want to learn more about. But that's what I was thinking of when I read it. I was like, wow, they found an entrance to hell. They didn't have to actually kill Dante to bring him there. He was able to go as a mortal human being who was still alive. So that was the first thing that really stood out to me. Do you think that maybe it appeared to be physical or they said that it was physical, but it just seemed so physical to Dante because he was inside of his head so deeply and going through the things he needed to go through before he was able to reach purgatory? I mean, I get what you're saying, too. Alt history is really cool to me, too. Hollow Earth is awesome. So, yeah, 100% there could be some real physical entrance, but I think there's something deep, deep inside us, too, that there's some other alternate dimension or... Mm-hmm. some other place that we can be that isn't it could be physical but it's in yeah a different way. no i Does totally hear what you're saying yeah because okay. like you could uh, like for the the purpose of this story it's it could all be like dante is having this horrible psychedelic trip or this night this like night terror where he's in his like astral body and he's traveling through this other dimension and then he wakes up at the end and has gone through all that. And now he's like a reform change person. Yeah. That's like a gnarly uh, mushroom trip or something. It doesn't make yeah, exactly. it less real either. Just because exactly. it's not physical in this plane, in this earth, and that you can't access it now, it doesn't mean it didn't exist or doesn't, you know? Well said. Well said. Yep. Whether you're, you know, on DMT or whatever, it's, yeah, it's as, as real as any normal waking experience. So... Yeah. The fact that, you know, yeah, the uh, hollow earth thing, I just found out about that today, that there's a connection there between all of that. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to dive into that oh, later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love the hollow earth stuff. I love it. Hardly anybody yeah. to really uh, go into it. You know, I mean, everybody knows the, uh, what is that? Operation High Jump and uh, mm-hmm. Admiral Byrd and all that. Everybody yeah. knows that story, but that's basically where the information stops on that. Like there hasn't mm-hmm. been ever since then, they sealed off Antarctica. I mean, dude nobody's going back to try that again so it makes me think that you guys are familiar are... yeah yeah uh there's a interesting story from wikileaks so are you familiar with the penguins in antarctica that were being harvested for uh research purposes no no oh so apparently and this is from wikileaks 
they would harvest the pineal gland of a penguin and extract something out of it. Um, and this was released on that WikiLeaks email dump. I forgot where those pineal glands of the penguins were sent to, but it's very esoteric and spooky. And who knows what else kinds of research or explorations are happening now in Antarctica. I would love to find out. I don't think I ever will. I but. Some, uh, <laughs> something like the you know smoking the toad where mm -hmm. they secrete something that you can dry up and smoke it and get high off it. Who knows? They're just trying to fast track their way to the creator. <laughs> that is really yeah. what I feel. Like. They're, just, they're trying to figure it out with adrenochrome, pineal glands right. extracted from penguins because they can't find it on their own. They're disconnected. They don't have the same ability that we have. And that's why these elite people or whatever you want to call them, they're not the same as us humans. Mm -hmm. We can do it on our own. So they're trying to disconnect us as much as they can with distractions like yeah. the media and social credit scores and TikTok, fun things like mm -hmm. that. Kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like in an allegorical sense, that kind of reminds me of uh, like Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, so think about the hobbits in the Shire. They can live in absolute peace. Like they're totally content and happy and they live this agrarian, like they live off the land and they're all like plump and healthy. Uh, but then you have like the folks over in Mordor, like on the dark side, and they're going through such pains to extract resources from the, the earth and build things. And they're like doing all this dark shit. And m meanwhile, all the, all the hobbits are just chilling over in the Shire. And, uh, you know, it's two, two different lifestyles. So whatever those, uh, weird Rockefeller types are up to in Antarctica, um, you know, I would like to try some penguin pineal gland. I wouldn't be opposed to that. It's the first time for everything, right? <laughs> Whole garlic butter sauteed. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> I do want to try DMT, though. I would like to see the other side. I just know it's possible. And it definitely happens when we die. That's when our pineal oh, yeah. gland activates. So we we can get there, I think, now. We're just told that it's woo and stupid. And, wow, you're dumb. You think you can astral travel? You think there's a god? Like, there's... So much, so much of a push towards atheism and individualism and selfishness in this world right now. Is... No connectivity. So they're trying to just differentiate everyone and separate everyone six feet apart. Stay away. Stay in your own house. Don't even start a family. Fuck that. You don't even need kids. You can just abort them. You can kill them after 28 days now in some states. Cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, the breakdown of the nuclear family has been a thing for a very long time, especially in uh, minority communities. It's a huge mm -hmm. push for that. But lately, they haven't even been having to try that hard because, I mean, you look at the graph of men's sperm count just mm -hmm. skydiving the last few, several decades, I guess. And then, you know, with I mean, whatever you want to say about the jab and infertility, but I mean, it's fucking up chicks. Uh, periods which has to do with their fertility so that combined with low te or low sperm counts and all this stuff yeah. so they're they're making it real uh, easier on themselves to have less of us around uh, right. i guess I, I was gonna say it on the tavern the other night when you guys were on you and shane were both on actually and we were talking about you guys were talking about kids and you were talking about how you teach um high school and i was like it's our job to teach our children because we have kids. We, I don't know. Do you have kiddos of your nope. own? Uh, nope. I'm, I'm uh, currently single. Uh, but yeah. Oh All right. Available bachelor here, everybody. He's hey. got risk babies. So, <laughs> so, so what I was saying, a lot of people on that were on that night either didn't have kids or their kids are, are grown and our kids are 10 and 16. So they're at wow. the timing okay. for just being like, Hey, Hey guys, we love you Moon. we want you to be yourselves, but here's what's going on. And you have to kind yeah. of get to their level and not that they're down on a different level because it's lower. Mm -hmm. It's just their children and they don't, they haven't experienced the same things. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to show them, especially my daughter who's 16 and only just wants to go to Japan when she turns 18 and mm -hmm. doesn't understand that you might have to get the jab to travel and she's going to have to balance that out. She doesn't mm -hmm. want that now, but who knows what could change her mind in the future. So it's our job when we have kids. And I think it's a message we should share with everyone out there. Our children, our children are our future. Not trying to be like Whitney Houston up in here or whatever, but like we have to talk to this younger generation and say, hey, like you can do this too. You're not just some dumb kid. Let's bring you in on this and we'll show you what's going on. And 
and we don't have to say it and we don't have to lead with like the earth is flat and reptilians are adding everything like we don't have to be that is interesting if you about it no yeah i'm just kidding we don't even believe in any we i don't know what's real and i don't care and that's kind of what i lead with i'm not sure but here are some red flags that i see in the news and when someone says to do certain things here's what to pay attention to do you see people dropping dead do you think you should really just go get a needle in your arm from someone you don't know and you don't know what's in there and our kids are very responsive to it i just want it to continue and everybody should do that just plant a seed of Inquis inquisitivity? I don't know. Yeah. Inquisitiveness. Yeah. Inquisitiveness? Take it from yeah, the English teacher. Let them be inquisitive <laughs> about things. Let them question everything and right. not in an asshole way. They don't have to be a jerk. I don't want to say question everything and tell say fuck the government or you know, fuck authority. No, it's okay. Be nice. Those people are humans. They have jobs and they're yeah. just doing their job too. Be respectful. Know. It's as the same as know. the Walmart employee that tells you to put on your mask. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not going to, but I'm also not going to yell at them because they're just doing their job. She's that's got what a I've paycheck said. to earn. Yeah. For well, sure. That's, Carl's what Jr. that's what they chose. <laughs> that's her path. So I'm not going to make her day suck because she told me to put on a mask and it's annoying to me because it's not personal at that point. Mm. And we have to teach our kids the difference between those things because they think the world revolves around them and it does not. They, they need to adapt to the world. And survive through it, and I want yeah. my kids to be survivors. Well, there's there's difference between uh, the monsters that rule us that may or may not be human, and then the so-called NPCs that are just mindlessly going around like drones. And it's the NPC mm -hmm. thing. I think is very real, but I think it's almost it like is. just a. Uh, it's like waking up a. It's it's like a robot becoming conscious when they finally yeah. snap out of it. If it's possible, yeah. they do. But that's the drone at Walmart that's like, hey, yeah, how come you don't have a tattoo or where's your mask or whatever else? They don't know. They have it's just totally. I think above it's their like head. the minions yeah, yeah. that go on the boss level. Like when you're playing a video game, as an example, there's the boss that is tracking your every move, and then there's some minions that they let out that are gonna do the same kind of thing and mimic the moves. Right. They're just set out as a distraction. So if a bunch of NPCs do something, the people who are easily influenced, who are actually human, might follow along and some mm -hmm. people are going to question it and then the media will double down and be like why don't you want to do what all these people are doing and right. then some yeah. might leave and the people that stay are like the select few that get to have free thinking all to themselves and then get Yay. punished for it <laughs> no big I don't time, think so. big time. I, yeah i don't know i think we're rising up enough i've seen enough oh, in yeah. the media where they switch their narrative and when they switch it i'm like oh fuck yeah, we're doing a good job because they wouldn't have to fight so damn hard if we weren't challenging them. It's true. You know? Yeah, we've certainly put them under a lot of pressure. And there are really like, I want to use two metaphors to kind of comment on what you just said. The first one, probably everybody knows, which is in the Matrix, they have Mr. Smith. So he's the program designed to guard the Matrix. And if it starts to operate in a way that's outside of their scripted program, then he's sent in to correct it. So anyone who's committing a thought crime or is sharing dangerous misinformation or has unacceptable views, Mr. Smith is going to be unleashed on them. And he's going to go in there like any NPC would and, um, you know, oh, danger, danger. There's an, a, a bug in our coding. Like we have to eliminate it ASAP. So then they'll cancel you. Or number two, um, are you guys f familiar with Night by Ellie Wiesel, the autobiography? Mm, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. So Eli Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor. So he was 15 years old when he was sent to Auschwitz. And the, the whole idea there is that there are, you know, the regular Nazis, and then there are what's called the Kapos. And a Kapo is a Jew who was a prisoner in the concentration camp and was well-behaved, could follow orders. So they would pay attention to that. The Germans would take careful notes, almost like a psychologist, and take note on who followed orders, who didn't fuck around, and who, who could they actually trust? So they would choose these select Jews to become capos. And it sounds a, a lot like cop, right? It's capo. They become prison guards. So they would take these obedient Jews and turn them into prison guards. And those are kind of like the NPCs who are brainwashed by their captors. It's like they have Stockholm Syndrome, and they become guards for the very people that are enslaving them. And that sounds a lot like what you were saying, Jen, with NPCs. So that's Capo, K-A-P-O. Oh, 
<clears throat> That's Weird. a lot like that. That what was the show we were watching? The vampire show where it had Nazis involved, but they were vampires as well. Oh, Nazis love vampire. their occult magic. No, no, no. Oh no, it wasn't. It was a whole show we were watching. It was like the Strain, I think. Is oh, what it was okay, called. Yeah. So the Strain mm. is very similar to this, and it was a show we didn't even want to watch, but it's super similar to what's going on. It's. I can't believe how pertinent this show was to our present situation. And it's from several years it ago. It has to too. do with Nazis and vampires, but it's it's all about control and how mm. the, what their narrative has to play out. But they do. It does show some, exactly like what you're talking about mm. in that book in Night, where they they found the Jews who would obey, and they right. would say, "Okay, you're strong. Do you see these people right here?" Do you want to go to, you know, the gas chamber or do you want to go to this really comfy warm bed? And they'd give them a gun and say, shoot this person in the head. And if they did it, they got to have a special job, but it's they true. still weren't really treated great at the end of the day. That no, was in no. this show. And I know that that definitely really happened because all yeah, it is yeah. is my how far can we push you? What can we get you to do? How far can we break you? And then when we get you to that point, they're going to do whatever. It's disgusting. Yeah. But it's, people, it's we can awful. all rise above this too. Yes. So we can go back to them. We can fight back and they are not expecting it. They expect us to crumble. Mm. And I just don't think that's possible. But we're, I mean, I know it's not, it's not the only possibility, I guess. No. But everything I, that we're telling, everything we see shows us that, th that that's just what we should do. Nope. If someone robs your store, just like that, that's in every corporate, uh, lesson like you if someone comes in nope just turn over everything just bow down and just like, don't, don't fight back fight. yeah there's, you're, you're not gonna yeah. win don't fight back yeah <laughs> Wait, that's what we're taught as humans like no we're weak we're weak i think mm -hmm. we could do a lot more. yeah i mean well there's one other thing that you brought up too which is the fact that we don't want to disempower kids either like we want to encourage them to think for themselves so like i have one example I'm sure you've heard of Alex Stein and the fact that he's going to these, uh, you know, these meetings in Dallas to crash them and to do his thing. If you don't know who that is, you got to look up Alex Stein. So we've had him on the show. Yeah, a he's few our times. friend. He's yeah. a cool dude. We've had him on. He's yeah. great. Conspiracy Castle, Primetime 99. Love what you're doing. So really, like, there are so many issues that people are just not comfortable talking about sometimes because they know that it's very controversial. And if they say the wrong thing, then everyone's going to attack them. So with, with that being said, we recently did uh, persuasive speeches in my classes. So you can choose any topic you want within reason, like nothing that's inciting violence or anything like that, but you can persuade your audience to buy or do or think any th anything that you want. So I've heard a story. This is just an anecdote that I've heard secondhand from another class where a student wanted to talk about that issue of the swimmer who was competing in the women's competition and was actually born a male, this whole issue. And they didn't let the student do the, the speech. And it doesn't matter what side they were on, right? They could have been for or against it, or they could have just been making some other argument about that. But not letting those kids do the speech, not letting them present those ideas, I think is disempowering. So we should be able to give kids the opportunity within reason, of course, but still, give them that opportunity to explore what they're actually curious about and not shut them down. Don't cancel them. Don't treat them like they're not capable of thinking critically because especially when they're in, in high school, they're just figuring out how to use this thick skull of theirs. And once they can, they start to grow and evolve. And if we deny them the opportunity, then they're going to stay in that freshman mindset forever. Well, that's why it's uh, the, education is so terrible because it doesn't let kids do that it doesn't let them pursue what they're interested in it's like no you have to learn this algebra and this fucking history you have to learn all the same things every single kid learns the same thing and uh, i know when i was in school i didn't give a two fucks about like 90 percent of it there was some there was some like chemistry or like science or some other kind of weird shit that i'd be like oh i want to do this and get a microscope or you know whatever mm -hmm. I don't want to be sitting there going X over Y and E is A and fucking algebra. I don't care. Stop. I'm not going to do anything anywhere close to that in my life. I guarantee you. And but I have not. That's why it's important for us to <laughs> tell our kids, hey, it's okay. When you have to go to these classes, pay attention. Like, 
take in what you can take in from it. My daughter's doing great in her classes. She's actually taking chemistry now. It's her only not honors class and she sucks at it. And I told her, I was like, don't take chemistry. Chemistry's awful. I, I shouldn't have said that to her, but she, no one does great. She said the highest grade in the class is a C plus. And yeah, she has a me. D plus. She has like straight eight, same. I was like, chemistry is really, it's just really challenging. They're like, hey, do you see all this on one side? It's going to equal completely different things on the other side. And I don't know how yeah. to get. To, it's a different language. To, like get, writing yeah. H2O is like a different language. All the chemical reactions right. and all that. And yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just some people get it and some people don't. And she wanted to take it. So I let her. I said, go ahead. Mm. Please just get a C and don't fail it because you'll have to take it again or take a different science and that will kind of fuck you up. But she's taking all honors classes and all advanced placement courses nice. in 10th grade. And then she has chemistry, which is just a regular course. And that's the only one she sucks at. I was like, well, yeah, chemistry, but, but it's okay. And I just told her, yeah. take what you can from it. Know that it sucks. No, you'll never use it again because who fucking cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't define you as a person. If you get a D in one class in 10th grade as a 16 year old. Who fucking cares? And don't worry about the social anxiety that do, yeah. do you oh, do. It's totally normal. Your students? All the time. Social yeah. Let me tell you, like, for social anxiety, it's less of the fact that it's happening in the classroom and more about, well, I go to meetings and meet with parents and students and teachers, and we have this discussion. And long story short, it's basically like, all right, Jimmy's not doing homework. Uh, he's not paying attention during class. So, Let's prescribe him more Adderall and see if that works. Everyone cool with that? Jeez. Okay. <laughs> but it's like true. And I, yes, there is like a culture of perfectionism in school. Like if a kid has one C or one D, it's like not the end of the world. That's totally normal. You're not supposed to be good at everything, but that's why school exposes you to all these different subjects, but you're not supposed to master all of them. You're supposed to find the ones that vibe with you the most. And Joe, what you were saying earlier, I mean, if I could go back and change anything, or if I ever can become like a homeschool teacher, I would say this, learn what you want to learn and make something out of it. Like be innovative. Don't just learn the same thing that everyone else has been learning, but what can you make or what could you build? What could you create? So like what I did a couple of weeks ago is I started to make little videos of my favorite podcasters and like put little music behind them. And it was like a cool little project. It was using some of the like basic skills that I picked up when I was uh, like 12 years old, putting out YouTube videos. And that was fun. And I learned something from the podcast and I got to have a little fun with it. If people can find projects for their kids, uh, especially teachers, where they can have fun making something, I mean, that's, it's to like simplify it. That's all they really need. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. That's what, so my daughter that's all she does is she does edits for videos for anime. She loves it, nice. but she also is a cool kid and does fun stuff. And I'm like, how do you do edits for anime? It doesn't in my head. She wants I'm to like, go to Japan, right? She does so bad. She loves what that. What do you culture. think about <laughs> the anime culture? Like, have you uh, gotten to learn about it at all? Like, I don't really know much about it, but yeah, a lot of my students love anime and I feel like I should learn a little bit about it, but I don't really know much about it. It's different. I know my kid and I know that she t she watches the deepest anime. She's she's told me stories about the the whole story of a show and I'm like this sounds dumb and then she keeps going and I'm like dude this is deep. It's like mm. virus stuff or people turning into zombies and so and so has to kill this person or every person who's a main character dies at the end. She mm. told us to watch Squid Games a year ago or before it was huge on Netflix, she started mm. watching it. It was right when it was first released. And then six months later, maybe, we started watching it because it was huge, but she had already watched it. She binged mm -hmm. it and she watched it in, is it Korean? I don't know. She watched it in the, because she watches anime so often, she watched it with the- Subtitles? Like, uh, the, yeah, the she watched it with subtitles. Yeah. We didn't. We were like, no, ew. Yeah, overdubbing like, is its own know, thing I watch now. everything. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, anime though, uh, the only problem I have with it is that I'm very weary of fucking animated shows. So mm -hmm. anytime there's a new animated show, I'm like, ah, but I'm usually a big fan of it. Like uh, Rick and Morty, my friend yeah, told me to watch yeah. it. And I'm like, another animated show. I'm sure it's great, dude. And we watched it and I was like, this is probably the best show I've ever fucking seen. Mm -hmm. I love it. Doo doo, bud. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, Rick and Morty is incredible. And uh, yeah, I mean, it. who knows? Like, there are probably a bunch of anime shows, like you said, Jen, that go really deep, that have uh, really cool themes. So I haven't really looked into it, but I do know that one of the most popular shows among, I don't want to say my peers, because they're mostly just 10th grade kids, but my friends watch this too, though. It's called Attack on Titan. Yeah, that sounds really bad, right? <laughs> no, it's... Uh, no, Maddie loves that show. Yep, yeah. she knows that one for sure. Attack on, on Titan is like... Uh, there's a civilization with like rings like in the inner ring that's like the elite and then like the outers the, yeah, and the titans are on the outer outside rings. and they have to yeah, break exactly. through the walls yeah. yes i've heard all about this one yeah <laughs> yeah it's wild but it's an interesting concept and it could be what's happening to us right now too so when she tells me these stories i'm like "Ooh, is that our reality huh but then it just makes me say hey whatever that's just a show but think about what's happening to us right now hmm mm hmm yeah, I had to explain propaganda to my kid the other day. It's not a conversation you think you'd have to have with a 10-year-old, but he brought up uh, wanting to buy a Ukrainian flag pendant or some shit. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm glad we have a 20-minute drive home because I'm about to <laughs> fuck the day up, dude. It's bad. I mean, That's a lot I'm to unpack. Like, kids now. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, think about it, like on a micro or macro scale, like the government might disclose some things. Like one day, maybe they actually will disclose a bit about extraterrestrials or UFOs or whatever, maybe. But they're probably thinking about it the same way that you think about your kids. Like, all right, what do we tell them first? How do we have this conversation? How do we disclose yeah. these things to them? It's like, I mean- 100%, uh, yes. Yeah. That's exactly how the government releases things to us. Now that I'm an adult, and I know that I've raised children. When I hear things from the government, like you're saying, Jake, I'm like, oh, this is just the little kid shit that we get. We're just like, mm -hmm. it's okay, mommy and daddy love you. It's it's not it's not you, it's us. Okay, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. fine. You did nothing wrong. And yeah, it's it's hard because I know yeah. that they're they're not going to release the hard shit. They don't think we can handle it. No. And another well, point on that. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. No, no, go for it. I was going to say, like, uh, you know, if the if the government is advertising something, it's not usually healthy either. Like, if you – I haven't watched cable TV in a long time. I'm happy that this apartment doesn't have cable. But I used to watch it a lot. I'm sure everyone did. And most of the commercials were, one, pharmaceuticals. So that's one thing. And listen to those side effects that come afterwards. Those are There's, the best commercials. Yeah. <laughs> when they, they're playing a super happy song and playing yep. something beautiful in the background. Side effects may <laughs> include suicide and death. Uh, it's like, <laughs> yeah, like They're like vomiting, diarrhea, delusions, thoughts of suicide. Do you want to jump off a bridge? Do you want to kill your neighbor? This might happen. It's okay. But guess what? You won't have a leaky ass anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Problem <laughs> solved. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the shit show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, what I, mean, I was gonna uh, say is uh, yeah. we're, we haven't really got your opinion on uh not that it really matters, but like what do you think is going on in the world? Like what what's happening? Where are we going? Okay. Uh I mean we we've certainly uh opened up the discussion quite a bit about propaganda and my personal experience with this is in April of twenty twenty, that's when I graduated. So I became like a certified high school teacher once everything shut down. So I couldn't get a job until later like no, no, nothing was open they, they wouldn't hire a new teacher to do remote work so i was unemployed all summer getting those trump bucks so <laughs> that was kind of nice but that gave me a lot of time to just look into shit and i think that's what a lot of people who were not essential workers in 2020 did was they went down those rabbit holes and uh you know my my background is more in health like i've tried all kinds of diets. I've gotten into some holistic health things. Uh, it's kind of what Mira and I talked about today was the fact that um, you could like, you could look into pharmaceuticals is a great example that I want to talk about today. There is a pharmaceutical cure or treatment for most things, but it does come with all these side effects, like you said. So what they don't advertise are the alternative methods that you could use that have less side effects. Example, I got surgery on my shoulder and of course they're going to prescribe you opioids and I didn't want them. I was like, please don't prescribe them to me. Like I'll smoke weed. I'll just relax. Like I'll have some collagen. Like that'll, that'll work fine. And they insisted, like they literally would not send me away unless I was like, all right, 
I'll take this, whatever it was, like Percocet or something. I don't know. I didn't take any of it. I was terrified of it. Yeah. So uh, in the direction that we're going, I mean, me personally, I've come up against this vaccine mandate. And thankfully, I not a lot of people had this opportunity, but I was able to get religious ex- exemption for it. I know some some people were not given that that same privilege where it was, all right, take this or we're going to fire you and replace you. And that's kind of the dark reality of teaching or nursing or some of these other jobs is that you are so easily replaceable. So like they don't give a fuck. Like if you have, uh, you know, different views, then they're just going to like can you and then find someone else who would obey. So that was my experience with it. And now. I'm sure you've seen that montage of brought to you by Pfizer and it's just like over and over again. And it's like, that's the kind of world that I see us moving into is not in so much of a dark sense, because like you said, Jen, people are fighting back and people are starting to put pressure back onto the other side. So I want to say this, we can allow these corporations to run the whole government, the whole world. They already are to some degree, like the alphabet corporations, like the Googles and the Facebooks and those kinds of things. But people will have to allow them to do that. We have to give them our permission to do these things. So I think through podcasting, through having these conversations, uh, let's say there's someone watching this Rockfin stream right now who was on the fence about uh, their views on something or, you know, People can be inspired. I was inspired by listening to so many podcasters on the Alt Media United Network. So shout out, shout out to Mark from my family. That thinks I'm I'm crazy, but I think the 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 important thing that I want to circle back to always is yes, we are moving towards a dark reality, but together as a community, uh, we will keep it light, and it's going to get dark no matter what. There's nothing we can do about that. These are forces beyond our control. But all we can really do while we pass through hell and reach paradise on the other side is try to make it a little easier for each other and look out for each other. And that's, if I could leave people with a message, it would be that is that, you know, you shouldn't have to go through hell alone. We're all moving towards some kind of fate or some kind of destiny. I truly believe that, but it's up to us to make sure that we head in the right direction as opposed to staying in hell and not ever coming out on the other side. And it seems like they're trying to keep us in hell I really don't think hell's a a place you go to when you die. It's it's a place you create while you're alive. It's a place they tell you exists, and it's a place you convince yourself of. So when Mm -hmm. we're walking through hell, when we have people by our side, we can find the joy in it and find Mm -hmm. things that maybe someone will give you an opinion you never even thought of. And then Mm -hmm. it becomes not hell at all because you're with your friends and you're just on a fucking journey. And then all of that negativity doesn't exist anymore. And that's the last thing these people want. They want Mm -hmm. us to see everything around us as something that's going to come up and destroy us. But when we are able to say like, hey, actually, I don't really care about this. It doesn't affect me at all. No big deal. And just keep walking past. That's what makes them the most angry. So we just need to keep, like you said, Jake, just have people by your side, keep talking to each other, get strength in that, and then keep going. And we'll find our way out. And it doesn't matter. We're not really in hell. We're only in hell if we think we're in hell. Mm-hmm. And we can make it as beautiful or as horrible as we want to. That's the power of humanity. And it is getting better because there are, I mean, in my opinion, because there are so many people that are popping up out of the woodwork, not just on podcasts yeah. and shit, but all around. There's so many people that are of the same opinion and are like trying to figure this out and it's it's a lot more encouraging now than oh wow sorry (laughs) a lot more encouraging now than it was like two years ago to find people that think like this like i think all of us have kind of thought like this our whole life you're kind of just built in with it but it doesn't really like activate and then you think about you know back when you're a kid and you're like i was a weird little fucker where like i thought about things very strange huh Then I'm like, so I'm so grateful for my parents preparing me for life by saying, you need to play outside for six hours. Mm -hmm. And now I never do that to my daughter. I'm like, you could be abducted by a child molester. (laughs) So I didn't do that to my kid, but we played outside, no Mm. cell phones. We didn't have, you know, chip trackers in our arms. We just had our bikes and we would ride for miles and miles far away in Massachusetts. It was the suburbs, but still. What year is this, babe? (laughs) (laughs) Probably, <laughs> 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 honestly, oh, the glory days. 
don't know. Yeah, yeah, the early nineties were the best. <laughs> That's when we just go off on our bikes and yeah. hang out, whatever. But we would build forts. We would figure shit out on our own. Mm. We wouldn't have a phone to fall back on. We wouldn't be like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? So-and-so said I was ugly. Let me look at a million <laughs> pictures on Instagram and see how ugly I really yeah, am. Yeah, somebody I don't know yeah. 500 miles away left a shitty comment. My day is ruined now. Not power any of that so we're the best prepared generation, though, mm -hmm. and we're acting like we're not because we're preying off how our kids are coming up and saying mm -hmm. how we should be social credit score shit. My daughter yeah, yeah. told me she was 10. She made a she made a TikTok, but it was called Musically at the time before TikTok existed. It was it's like the prelude like to TikTok. Music at Motley. Yeah. And uh she made one where she was on her hoverboard and she did some weird thing and she got a thousand likes and it was nice. her favorite thing. She was 10 and she came down and said Oh my God, mom, look, I got a thousand likes and a bunch of blue check marked people liked me. Mm -hmm. And I was so mixed about how I reacted they to it. They hit those oh, dopamine yeah, yeah. receptors right yeah. on. But I just said, I was like, oh, good job, honey. That's so cool. But you know, that doesn't define you, right? And I was kind of shitty in that way. I kind of shut her down, like, that doesn't matter. And she was like, you don't even care. <laughs> But I was like, no, I do. I love you. But they don't define you. Please. I totally care, but I don't. It's a cool video. And yeah, those yeah. thousand people liked it, but it doesn't matter. She showed me a video right before she flew out on Friday. I uh, She showed me a random, she shows me random TikToks all the mm -hmm. time. I don't have TikTok. So she just shows them to me of, there are always things where someone's doing something really fast or screaming. Those are the ones she finds hilarious. And I said, oh, that one you just showed me, is that girl popular on TikTok? She's just screaming in her car. That's weird. And she said, oh, no, she's not really that popular. And then she flashed me her phone and showed me this girl's followers. And she had 487,000 followers. What? And she, but at the, <laughs> so at the same time, she said, no, she's not really that popular. And meanwhile, I see 487K. And I'm like, oh, so your oh, definition... God. There's huge inflation. That's a big in red flag, I think. Score, okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, there's, like, there's talk about how TikTok inflates their numbers anyway, and it's to get people pulled in where, yeah. like, they, the kids come in and they're like, wow, I have, like, 9,000 followers already. That's crazy. My first video has, like, 100,000 hits. That's insane. And then it kind of goes down from there. So it's kind of like a pull you in thing where it's like, look, yeah. you're so popular with but this stupid retarded so video. It's like the COVID stuff, yeah. too, where they were like, this many cases, this many cases, this yep. many cases, this many deaths. But if you do the math and you take the deaths – and divide it by the number of cases, it's 0 0.002 or mm -hmm. 0 0.001 in almost every And yet everyone's day. panicking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They see the big numbers. They're already, they're putting those numbers into us. They're like, oh, this many hundred thousands, this many hundred millions. And if you just do the, some simple math, whoop, mm -hmm. no big deal. It's, it's a very small ratio of people who are dying compared to the number of people who have it. But when you say that, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. Meanwhile, I'm like, sorry, I had to take long division in second grade. So fuck you. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's just uh, Plato's cave up in this bitch. We're just seeing oh, shadows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great reference. Oh, we'll have to do a show on that sometime, too. Oh, dude, we're at an hour. Yeah. Anything else not on uh, Dante or anything before you want to head out? Or we can do a, a very specific episode on Dante's Inferno after we yeah, all... Yeah, we could do a deep agree. dive episode. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, as far do, as the be... shit show goes, like, I want to say this. For the Sunday shit show, let me give you one thing that uh, we can end with on Dante. Think of it as, like, a sneak preview for our deep dive that we'll do later. So... Hell yeah. There's nine circles. I'm going to tell you about circle number three. And this is the area of the gluttons. So those are people who would consume and consume and consume, kind of like how we were just talking about TikTok. They could spend hours consuming and just absorbing all this information. Or it could be like, you know, consuming food. I think that's what most gluttons are referred to as um, biblically speaking. So the gluttonous area is a dump. It's basically like, all right. Hell is this underground world. It's this underground city. It's this hollow earth civilization. And they have to throw all their garbage somewhere. So it ends up in this third circle. It's this giant garbage dump. So I want to think about, do I want to end up there? Do I want to just mindlessly consume all this content? Like, for example, 
am I going to read the headline of an article or am I going to click on it and actually look into it? There's a big difference there. And I hope people realize that if they only look on the surface, they're just going to get trashed. But if they actually look deeper, they're going to find what's true and what's not or what vibes with them, what doesn't. They, they have to look beyond the surface. So just like I saw Dante as this story about putting the fear into God, the, putting the fear of God into people, I realized it was much deeper than that. And so I'm looking forward to, to diving into it later. But uh, yeah, the that glutton area, it's a big garbage dump. And, and what Virgil tells Dante about this area is, well, thank God that we're just visiting here. Because if we stayed here and lived here, I mean, you would hate it. So it's good to visit hell every now and then. We should all look into our shadow, but don't stay there. Come out on the other side, connect with your family, with your friends, your community. Listen to your favorite podcasters like Legit Bat Podcast. Uh, speaking of Ben, I'm looking forward to meeting you, Ben. Uh, but uh, Joe and Jen, it was awesome hanging out with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for inviting yeah, me. Dude. And thank you so much That's for really all the great. support really that you've given you. me at this point. Yeah, this is so much fun. Well, always uh, glad to be of help. Uh, one last time before we go, though, where can we find you? What, what's new coming out on your show? What's the next the next thing you're doing? So before I came on this live stream, I published my first episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, just type in Local Listens Podcast. You'll find it there. That's with Mira Taylor. I am planning to release my episode with Shane, who you just spoke to, on Tuesday. And by Wednesday, I should have an additional episode with my friend Chris, which is a deep dive into an anime show, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, which is probably the greatest kids show ever created so anyone who's listening who has kids doesn't matter how old you are even if you're uh in your 60s you could still enjoy avatar the last airbender it's a great show so i have a cool deep dive with my friend there so please follow me on those platforms and i'm looking forward to speaking with anyone else who wants to share their truth on the local listens podcast Hell yeah. Well, thanks, dude. Thanks, everybody in the live chat and all the audio listeners. We'll see you next time. Peace.